heard me say it before, but I'm going to repeat it. American riflemen are the best riflemen in the world because the training they get is the best in the world. You've begun that training with the sighting and aiming exercises, and you're ready now to go on to the next step. Position exercises. There are four firing positions. Prone, sitting, kneeling, and the standing or offhand position. You know, any old timer can walk down the firing line and come pretty close to picking out the men who'll do the best shooting. There's nothing mysterious about it. He simply spots the men who've taken the best positions. Good positions mean good scores. Poor positions mean poor scores. It's as easy as that. But here's the thing to remember. We're not teaching you these positions so that you can riddle off a string of bullseyes on the target range. We're teaching you to kill your enemy before he can kill you. If you're going to survive on the battlefield, you've got to be able to shoot fast and straight from any position. You've got to be able to drop into that position instantly, automatically, without thinking about it. And it must be correct the first time. Take a good look at these positions. They look easy. But you're not going to find these positions easy at first because they make you use muscles you never knew you had. But don't worry about that. We'll harden up those muscles. Your work in the position exercises also covers the use of the sling, holding your breath while aiming, and aiming. We'll take up the sling first. Anyone here know the reason for the sling on the rifle? Carried with, sir? That's right. Any other reason? Peterson? Yes, sir. It's a big help in steadying the rifle. Check. That's the answer. Now let's see how we go about getting the effects of it. There are two ways to use the rifle sling. The first, like this, is called the loop sling. The other, called the hasty sling, is rarely used except in the standing position. And we'll show you how to adjust it when we come to that position. The loop sling is used in all other positions. Here's how to adjust it. Place the rifle butt on the right thigh and cradle it in the curve of your right arm so that you've got both hands free to adjust the sling. Unfasten the lower hook and refasten it near the butt swivel. This loosens the lower loop. Unfasten the upper hook and refasten it so that the upper loop hangs down to about the pistol grip. But it may need further adjustment. The correct place for the upper hook depends on the man. You'll get your fit by trying it out. After your instructor is satisfied you have the right pair of holes, mark them so that you'll find them at a glance. Twist the sling one half turn to the left and insert the left hand through the upper loop from right to left. Slide the loop well up your left arm Leave the loose end free and use both hands to work the upper hook and the first keeper down close against your arm. Then pull down the second keeper against the upper hook. This locks the upper loop in place against your arm and keeps it from slipping. You can't shoot with a loose loop sliding down your arm. Once the loop is correctly adjusted, move your left hand over the top of the sling and place it under the rifle against the upper sling swivel. The rifle must rest in the V between your thumb and forefinger and on the heel of your hand. Wrist straight, fingers relaxed. The sling must lie smoothly along your hand and wrist. If it doesn't, you've done something wrong. 
This is the way you hold the rifle. Now let's go over the loop sling adjustment once more. Place the butt on your right thigh, cradle the rifle in your right arm, unfasten the lower hook, refasten it near the butt swivel, twist the sling a half turn to the left, insert your left arm through the upper loop from right to left, Pull the loop well up your arm. Then work the upper hook and the first keeper down against it. And pull down the second keeper to lock the upper loop. So much for the loop sling. Your instructors will go over this detail with you. Are there any questions? Yes? Sir, with Japs and Germans shooting at you, like you said, Looks like you wouldn't have much chance to get that sling on. Keep thinking like that, and you'll live to tell your grandchildren about it. You're right, of course. Use the sling whenever you have time to use it, because it gives you greater steadiness. After you've learned sling adjustment, you're ready to start work on positions. Let's take a look at the prone position first. In the prone position, the rifleman lies flat on his belly with his legs stretched out comfortably. His inside ankle bones are on the ground, or as near it as he can get them without strain. His spine is straight. His body makes an angle of 30 degrees or less with the line of aim. The amount of the angle depending on the rifleman's build. When you're trying out these positions, your instructors and coaches will help you to find the angle that suits you best. Thereafter, it's up to you to practice the position until you can drop into it without thinking about it. The sergeant here is well behind his rifle. His weight is relaxed forward against the sling. Thus his body takes up the recoil and he is not jolted out of position each time he fires. Look at his left hand and arm. The rifle rests on the heel of the hand in the V between the thumb and the first finger. His left wrist is straight. His fingers are relaxed. His left elbow is under the piece. It's vertical. I can press down hard on this rifle and it'll give a little, then come right back to its proper position. But when the elbow is not under the piece, the least pressure will make the rifle sag way off to the side because muscle instead of bone supports it. A muscle gets tired, a bone doesn't. So remember, elbow under the piece. Now look at his right arm and hand. His right elbow is a little forward of his right shoulder. His right upper arm makes an angle of about 45 degrees with the ground. His shoulders are about level. The rifle fits into the hollow of his right shoulder. That's important. Raise your left hand and feel that hollow in your shoulder. Curl your shoulder forward and the hollow is still more pronounced. Now look at Sergeant Higgins. See how snugly his rifle fits into that hollow? I don't want to see anybody in this company trying to shoot with a rifle on the point of the shoulder here. All that will get you is a sore shoulder. And that means flinching. And flinching means poor shooting. Grasp the small of the rifle stock firmly with your right hand. And get this. Put your thumb across the stock or on top of the stock, never alongside the stock. With your thumb in the right position, you've got a firm purchase for your trigger squeeze and a good support for your cheek. The finger goes inside the trigger guard against the trigger and the finger is clear of the stock. You can use any part of your finger from the tip to the second joint to squeeze the trigger. What seems natural and comfortable to you will probably give you the steadiest squeeze and for that reason is the best. Press your cheek firmly against the stock and on your thumb. Let your neck muscles relax and hold your head so that you're looking not out of the corners of your eyes but straight ahead with your eyes level. 
That's the correct prone position. It varies a little with each man, depending upon his build. But there isn't much difference. You'll soon discover the exact position that suits you. From there on, it's a matter of practice. You will have targets to aim at in all of your exercises. Every time you get into position, align your sights on a target. A good soldier does this instinctively. He never even thinks about it. Here's something else. When you take any of the correct firing positions, you will find that the rifle aims naturally and without effort at some one point. If this point is not on the center of the target, move your whole body till the line of aim is the natural line. There's a good way to tell if your body is lined up correctly. After you're in position, close your eye and relax. Then when you open it, if you're on the center of the target, you're okay. If not, shift your whole body. If you shift the rifle independently, instead of your body, you'll be in a strained, uncomfortable position. And no man can shoot his best when he's fighting his own muscles. These men are demonstrating some of the things not to do, but they are common errors. Let's take a look at this first man. His body is at too great an angle with a line of aim. Now he's behind the rifle, as he's got to be. Look at this man's right elbow. It's too close to his body. He's unsteady. His left hand's too far back. And he's got his thumb alongside the stock. Now he'll assume the correct position. This man's left elbow is not under the piece. They'd have a devil of a time staying on the target. Errors like this stand out plainly. Others are not so easy to pick up. When you're acting as the coach, keep a sharp eye on your pupil. When he's wrong, show him where he's wrong and why. Then make him take the correct position so the point will be burned into his mind. Don't forget, when you take the prone position correctly, the muzzle will automatically drop back on the target after each shot. This saves time. And in battle, a few seconds are enough to settle the argument between you and that guy on the other side. Now, the sandbag rest position is just like the prone position, except that a sandbag is used to support the left forearm, wrist, and hand. The pupil takes the correct prone position and aims at his target. The coach then manipulates the sandbag until it is slightly higher than the back of the pupil's left hand. The coach punches the sandbag with his hand until he gets a perfect fit. This is the coach's job. The pupil can't do it for himself. Next, he faces the pupil, straddles the rifle barrel, and slides the narrow side of the sandbag against the left forearm so that it supports the forearm, the wrist, and the back of the hand. Only the back of the hand rests on the top of the sandbag. It's a common error for beginners to rest the rifle on the sandbag, but it won't work. The sandbag supports the forearm, wrist, and hand. Now Sergeant Higgins is going to show you the sitting position, which is a good one in high grass, brush, or on sloping ground. For the sitting position, you'll usually have to make your sling two holes shorter than for the prone position. Your body faces half right from the target. As you sit, spread your feet apart. Farther apart than your knees. And brace your heels firmly. Get your toes down, flat on the ground if you can get them there, and relax your ankles. Keep your knees straight up, not bow-legged. And keep them fairly low, about 10 inches off the ground. The point is that you've got to get the back of your left upper arm 
firmly brace three or four inches down on your left shin. In this way, with your left elbow under the rifle, where it belongs, the weight of the rifle comes straight down on your leg. Hold your right hand and arm as you do in the prone position against your right knee so that your right shin bone forms a block for your upper arm. Lean well forward from your hips, not your waist. Keep your back straight and your weight forward. Don't rest your elbows on your knees. You'll wobble. Your elbows will roll around. No man can shoot in a position like that. Get your arms well down on your legs, several inches. Remember that left elbow. Keep it under the rifle. Now you've got a solid, steady position and you won't be knocked off balance by the recoil. That's the normal sitting position. It's the best one and it'll be used in this company. We may have a few men of exceptional build who are not suited to it. Heavy men may have to use the crossed ankle position. And men with exceptionally long legs may have to take the crossed leg position. But your platoon leaders will decide which men, if any, are to use these alternate positions. Now, if there are no questions, we'll go on to the kneeling position. Your sling is usually the same length as for the sitting position. First, the half right face. Then get down on your right knee and sit on your heel. So that your top of your foot is flat on the ground. It takes practice, but you can do it. With your heel inclined toward the target like this, your foot helps to brace you against the gun's recoil. Don't sit on the inside of your foot. Rapid fire would make you bob around like a cork. Sit firmly on the top of your heel with your weight well forward. Your left elbow is under the rifle and in front of your kneecap. Never on top of your kneecap. The position of your left leg depends on your build. The taller you are, the farther to the front your leg will be. Your instructors will help you find the position that suits you best. But your lower left leg, as seen from the front, must always be vertical. Keep your right elbow comfortably high. This makes a snug seat for the rifle in the hollow of your shoulder. If you drop your arm too far, the hollow disappears and the rifle butt tends to move out to the point of the shoulder. Another thing, the lower right leg forms a right angle with a line of aim. At first you'll find the kneeling position unsteady, but don't worry about it. It will never be as steady as the prone or the sitting position, but practice will strengthen your muscles and increase your steadiness. This brings us to the standing or offhand position and the hasty sling, which is rarely used except in this position. Let's start with the sling. First, loosen the lower loop. Twist the sling a half turn to the left. Hold the rifle with your left hand just back of the upper sling swivel and your right hand at the small of the stock with a thumb well over on the left side. Then swing the rifle so that the sling falls high on your upper arm. Let go of the rifle with your left hand, pass it under and over the sling, and regrasp the rifle near the upper sling swivel. The sling now lies smoothly along the arm and hand. It holds the left upper arm and stretches tightly across the chest. That's where you get support and you need all you can get in a standing position. Adjust your sling for a tight fit. Your instructors will help you. When you get it right, mark it. All right, Sergeant, let's see that again. Here's how to take the standing position. Face right until you're almost at a right angle to the line of aim. Place your feet about a foot and a half apart. 
Keep your body erect and well balanced. As you raise your rifle to firing position, fit the butt into the hollow of your shoulder, but higher than in the other position. High enough so that part of it can be seen above your shoulder from the rear. If the butt is too low, you'll have to strain your neck to get at the sight. If the butt is where it should be, your head and neck will be erect and natural. Keep your right elbow up. The higher the better. At first you'll find this unnatural and uncomfortable, but practice will fix that, and it gives you the power of all those arm muscles to take up the weight of the rifle. Here's an exercise that'll loosen up the shoulder joint. When you've done it enough, you'll be able to hold the rifle up with your right hand alone. The main job of the left hand is to steady the rifle, not to support it. Keep your left elbow well under the rifle. and the left hand as far forward as you can get it without strain or discomfort. At best, the standing position is unsteady, but you have to use it on the range and you have to use it in battle. So it's up to you to make the most of it. And that means plenty of practice. Nearly every recruit gets a brilliant idea of how to overcome this unsteadiness. He pulls his left arm back against his ribs, balances the rifle delicately on his thumb and two fingers, and blazes away. But that doesn't work, does it, Sergeant Higgins? No, sir. There's only one right way to hold the rifle in the standing position, and the sergeant is showing it to you right now. Thank you, Sergeant Higgins. Now you know the positions. I've given them to you, one after another, to let you compare them. See where they're different and where they're the same. All except the standing position have these points in common. Always hold the rifle at the small of the stock with your right thumb on top of or across the stock, but never along the side. Always keep your left hand against the upper sling swivel with the rifle in the crotch formed by the thumb and the first finger. Wrist straight Fingers relaxed. Always have your left elbow under your rifle and always squeeze the trigger with whatever part of your forefinger between the tip and the second joint feels firmest and most comfortable. Always press your cheek firmly against the stock and hold the butt of the gun in the hollow of the shoulder. In the standing position only, your left hand need not be against the upper sling swivel. Put it as far forward as you can comfortably. And your left elbow doesn't have to be directly under the rifle. Make these habits automatic, and they'll save you time and help you get a well-aimed shot off in a hurry. In these position exercises, of course, you don't squeeze a trigger. That comes later. But as soon as you're in any of the firing positions, you must hold your breath and aim. You do this in dry shooting, and you do it in actual firing. We'll show you the right way to hold your breath and still be comfortable. Take an ordinary breath, then let a little out. Then hold the rest of that breath while you aim and fire. To keep the air in your lungs during aiming, close your throat by swallowing. But uh, don't hold your breath too long. If you do, your muscles will get tense, and your eyes will blur, and you'll get wobbly. When this happens, relax for a moment and start over again. But don't think you can practically hold your breath. You either hold it or you don't. And while you're aiming and squeezing the trigger, you've got to hold your breath. Whenever you practice any of these position exercises, always check your position carefully. Close your eyes and then open them and see if you're on the center of the target. You must always have a target. Then hold your breath and aim. When you're coach, check your pupil carefully for all these points helps them. And it helps you, too. You learn from your pupils' mistakes. 
You know, it's a soldier's skill that brings him through a battle alive. And the degree of skill you attain as a soldier depends entirely on you. You've got to master not just one firing position, but all four. The enemy isn't going to give you a chance to choose the one you like best. You may be standing in a foxhole with your elbows on the parapet, or behind a tree, or a wall, kneeling in a shell hole, or heavy undergrowth, sitting in a sniper's post, or in a field, or you may be prone in a ditch, or out in the open. That's why we teach you the four firing positions and drill you in them until they become second nature, to get you ready for the tough spots. There'll be plenty of tough spots. And when you get into one, your whole job will be to get your shots off fast and hit what you're shooting at. So work on the firing positions now while you can. Later on, you'll be mighty glad you did. Because you'll get your enemy before he gets you. So far, we've learned what the correct sight picture is and how to get that picture into the sights of the rifle and hold it, whether you're prone, sitting, kneeling, or standing. Today, we take up the most important thing in rifle marksmanship, the trigger squeeze. By that term trigger squeeze, I mean the process you go through to bring your trigger back and fire your rifle. You know, when I was learning to shoot the rifle, my coach was an old sergeant who had fought in everything from Santiago to the Argonne. When we got to trigger squeeze, he told me something that has stayed with me ever since. Soldier, the trigger squeeze is the heart and soul, the beginning and the end of all good shooting. With it, you can part the hair of any guy you're after as far as you can see. Without it, you might as well throw away your rifle and start heaving rocks, because you'll do a hell of a lot better. <laughs> that old sergeant knew what he was talking about. You can be a ball of fire in your sighting and aiming. You can be red hot in your positions. But if you can't teach that trigger finger to squeeze Squeeze, squeeze. Well, you better get yourself a supply of rocks, as my old sergeant suggested, because you're going to need them. Now, there's nothing difficult about the trigger squeeze. It's just a question of applying a smooth, increasing pressure to the trigger until the rifle fires. The trick is to apply that pressure so smoothly and so steadily that you can't tell when the rifle is going to fire. If you can't tell when the rifle is going off, you can't jump or jerk or, as we say in the army, you can't flinch. Have you ever seen an untrained person fire the rifle? This is what happens. He gets all set, gets into position, draws what he thinks is a fine bead on the target, and then closes both eyes and yanks the trigger and he wonders why he never hits the target. Remember this, it's instinctive, natural, for every one of us to close both eyes and tighten up when we fire a rifle, if we know when that rifle's going off. But when you do that, you spoil your aim. You not only miss the bullseye, but you may miss the whole target. Now there's only one way to beat nature on this proposition. 
And that is to squeeze the trigger so smoothly and to increase the pressure so steadily that you don't know when the rifle's going off. If you don't know the rifle is going off, you can't close your eyes and flinch and spoil your aim before the shot is fired. The worst you can do is bat your eyes after the rifle is fired. And that doesn't hurt anything because the shot is already on its way. Simple, isn't it? Now let's see exactly how you go about learning this trick in your dry shooting. You practice the trigger squeeze in all positions, but you start out in the prone position with a sandbag because that's the steadiest. And it lets you concentrate on the sight picture and squeeze until you get the hang of it. First, you take the prone position and adjust yourself until the rifle points at the target without effort. Then the coach fits the sandbag. The coach takes his position and the exercise begins. Cock your rifle, hold your breath and aim. When you get the correct sight picture, take up the slack. By trigger slack, we mean the play between the trigger's forward point and the point where you first feel resistance. Take it up decisively. And while you're taking up the slack, you're starting your trigger squeeze. It's all one action of your finger working by itself, independent of the rest of your hand. You press smoothly, straight to the rear, and you increase the pressure steadily from start to finish. Your rifle has a fixed pull, say about four pounds. When you take up your slack, you take up part of that pull. Your constantly increasing pressure takes up the rest of it. And then the trigger gives, and the rifle fires but follow through, hold your position, hold your aim, and continue your increasing pressure. I'll tell you more about that later. What I want you to get now is this. If you squeeze the trigger properly, you can't know when the rifle is going to fire, and therefore you won't be able to flinch. Do you all understand that? There's another mistake all of us make when we first start shooting the rifle. Practically everyone has a violent impulse to yank the trigger the instant the sights come in correct alignment with a target. The beginner is tempted, particularly in the kneeling and standing positions where the unsteadiness is marked. Your sights move a little, side to side, up and down. Finally, they come to bear exactly on the bull's eye. So at that instant, you jerk the trigger. And this is what happens. You literally jerk your rifle clear off the target. You may not see it because both of your eyes will probably be shut tight and your muscles taut and braced for the shock. But whether you see it or not, the result is the same. A wild shot. There's only one way to get hits, and only hits count on a battlefield. And that is to squeeze the trigger. Now you've seen what happens when you jerk the trigger instead of squeezing it. I'm going to show you why it happens. Let's assume that I'm shooting at a target 500 yards away. I've got my sights lined up on the left edge of the bullseye. Since the range is 500, I would be using a B target with a 20-inch bullseye. If I fired now, I'd hit the left edge of the black. Now I'm going to move the rifle 20 inches to the right. And let's assume that I've moved the butt and the muzzle exactly the same distance. In other words, my line of aim now is exactly parallel to my line of aim before I moved the rifle. If I'd fired then, I would have creased the left edge of the bull. Who can tell me where I'd hit if I fire now? William? 
It increased the right edge of the bull, sir. Right. Do you all understand that? I can move this rifle back and forth 20 inches. And if I fired it anywhere within that space, I'd still get a bullseye as long as I kept my lines of aim parallel. I move the rifle 10 inches to the left again, still keeping my parallel line of aim. If I fired it now, I'd hit the bullseye dead center. But now watch this. I'm going to keep the butt in place and move the muzzle of the rifle just one inch. The butt stays the same as it is. I've moved the muzzle only. One inch. If I fired now, where would it hit? Norton? It would go off to one side, sir. I don't know just where it would hit. Neither do I know just where it would hit. But I can tell you this. It would miss the center of the bullseye by about 35 feet. Get that, 35 feet. The point is, when you jerk the trigger, you twist the rifle off the line of aim. When your sights are on the target, you can move your whole rifle from side to side, the width of the bullseye, and still hit it, if the rifle always stays parallel to the line of aim. But, if the butt of the rifle remains stationary and you jerk the muzzle off to one side as much as an inch, your bullet will miss the target by about 15 feet at 200 yards. By 21 feet at 300 yards. Or by 35 feet at 500 yards. A half inch movement of the muzzle means a miss by 17 or 18 feet at 500 yards. A quarter inch movement will cause a miss by eight or nine feet. And even a movement as small as a sixteenth of an inch may make you miss the bullseye. That's why it's so important to take the correct position so that your rifle and your whole body aim directly at the bullseye. Then, when you squeeze the trigger so smoothly that you don't know when the rifle's going off, the strike of your bullets will be changed only by the natural parallel movements of your body and your shots will be good. The unsteadiness caused by the natural movements of your body does not seriously affect the aim if you squeeze the trigger correctly. Okay, let's see if you got the point so far. What happens if you jerk the trigger? Harris? It throw your rifle muzzle off the target. If you were shooting at a guy, you wouldn't hit him. Right. Remember it, and you'll get plenty of bullseyes. And guys, too. What should you do? Kerinsky? Sir, you should squeeze the trigger so that you won't know when the rifle will go off. Good. Tell me when to squeeze it. O'Neill. You take your position, you hold your breath, you aim, you take up your slack, and then you pull the trigger. Do you pause after you've taken up your trigger slack before you begin to squeeze it? Austin? No, sir. Taking up uh, on the slack starts you on the squeeze. Right. And you go on steadily applying pressure until the hammer falls. Do you flinch and spoil your aim if you squeeze the trigger properly? Marshal. No, sir. Why not? Because you don't know when the rifle's going off. Check. Here's all there is to it. Every time you squeeze a trigger, be sure to do these things. Apply a steadily increasing pressure and continue smoothly until the rifle is fired. I know this seems easy. It is, but it must be practiced over and over. You must develop the habit of thinking only of the sight picture. You must practice until the trigger finger works independently, as if it had a mind of its own. Are there any questions? Sir, 
How much time should you take to squeeze the trigger? The expert takes about two seconds to fire a well-aimed shot. He can do this because he knows his job so well that the whole procedure is almost automatic. Speed comes with practice, and he follows through. Here's what we mean by follow through. After the hammer falls, go right on for an instant doing what you were doing. Hold your breath and aim and apply your steadily increasing pressure on the trigger. This helps overcome the natural tendency to let go, which disturbs the sight alignment. All right. We've shown you how to squeeze a trigger and follow through. And we have a neat little way of checking up on you. With each shot, we have you call out where you think the bullet is going to hit. This is calling the shot. And you do it the instant after the shot is fired. It's a cinch to call your shots if you're squeezing the trigger properly. For then your eye is open and you can see where your sights are aligned when the rifle fires. Of course, if you jerk the trigger or close your eyes and flinch, you won't be able to call your shot because you won't know where your sights are aligned when the rifle went off. The point is that only the man who squeezes the trigger properly can tell where his shot should hit. Here's the system we use to call our shots. Most of you know by now that a hit here is a five. And in this circle, a four. And in this one, a three. Anywhere else on the target, is a two. A miss is a zero. Now every time you fire a shot, imagine a large vertical clock face on your target with a bullseye in the center. This gives you a simple system of calling your shots. For example, suppose at the instant your rifle goes off, you see your sights align so that the bullet will hit here. Then you will call your shot a four at 12 o'clock because it's in the four circle and in the direction of 12 o'clock. A hit here would be a three at seven o'clock. Here, a two at two o'clock. And here, a four at 11. And here, a pinwheel five. On the range, you call your shots at slow fire. You and the coach compare the called shot with the actual shot to see if you know where you are aiming when the piece is fired. In dry shooting, there's no way to check whether or not you call your shots correctly, but it's to your advantage to do so. It helps you to develop the habit of concentrating on the sight picture and forgetting the trigger finger. It helps you to develop the habit to call the shot as you'll do on the range. Now in the trigger squeeze exercise, as in all the others, the coach must check every step. He sees that the sights are properly blackened and the sling correctly adjusted. He checks the pupil's position. If it's wrong, he tells him why and corrects it. He keeps an eye on the pupil's back during aiming to make sure he holds his breath properly. He sees the pupil takes up the slack and squeezes the trigger properly. He watches his eye to make sure he does not blink. When the pupil is actually firing the rifle, you can chalk up a flinch for him any time you see his eye close. The flincher closes his eye just before the explosion. Therefore, you can see it. If he doesn't flinch, you won't see his eye close because your eyes and his will close involuntarily at the sound of the explosion. Are there any questions about anything we've covered today? Okay. You're going to hear these things over and over again from your coaches, your squad leaders, your platoon leaders, and me. 
You're going to hear them and practice them until they become so much a part of you that you couldn't forget them if you wanted to. If you acquire these correct habits in your preparatory work, you'll find that the actual firing on the range is as simple as shooting fish in the kitchen sink. To be a good shot, you must dry shoot or squeeze off a hundred or more shots for every round fired and with as much care. Remember, skill in squeezing the trigger correctly is the best life insurance you can get. Everything we've been teaching you about the M1 rifle, sighting and aiming, positions, trigger squeeze, the whole course in marksmanship has been leading straight to the subject we're going to take up right now. Rapid fire exercises. But let me warn you right now about that word rapid. It does not mean taking just any position or hurrying your aim or jerking the trigger. It does not mean spraying bullets all over the landscape. Rapid fire means getting off well-aimed shots as fast as you can. It means firing as fast as you can fire accurately, no faster. The measure of your effectiveness in rapid fire is not shots per minute, but hits per minute. Remember that when you're on the range. And remember it when your target is a Jap or a German who's just as anxious to kill you as you are to kill him. Keep calm and hit what you're shooting at. Suppose you're in a supply detail that runs into an ambush. You've got to drop into position and get your shots off fast. But they won't do you any good unless they're well-aimed shots. Or suppose you're in a defensive position. All of a sudden, your enemy's in close, charging you from all sides. Your first impulse is to start blazing away wildly. You must not. Keep hold of yourself. You've got to shoot fast, but you've got to make every bullet count. Don't lose your head, even though hell's breaking loose all around you. Stay cool and shoot straight, and you'll live to tell your girl about it. Coolness in battle comes from confidence in yourself, and confidence comes only from hours of practice. Slow fire and rapid fire, over and over, with a stopwatch looking over your shoulder. We teach rapid fire in three positions. In the prone position, and in the sitting position, which are the best, and the kneeling position. The kneeling position is none too steady, but there are times when it comes in handy, and you would better be ready for just about anything. We don't teach rapid fire in the standing position, however. It's not worth it. In the standing position, you're not properly balanced for accurate aiming at high speed. The first thing you've got to learn in rapid fire exercises is getting into the right firing position in a hurry. You're allowed to choose the position you're going to take and to mark it. For the prone position, drop to the ground, get set, and line up your sights on the target. Mark the points for your right and left elbows and the butt of the rifle. Then, keeping your feet in place, stand up. Hold the heel of the stock in your right hand. Now you're ready. At first, you practice getting into the prone position by the numbers. On the count of one, bend your knees to the ground and throw your weight back. On two, place the butt of your rifle on the ground at the spots you marked for it. At three, place your left elbow on its mark. At four, take the butt of the rifle off the ground and fit it into the hollow of your shoulder. 
At five, return your right hand to the small of the stock and drop your right elbow to the ground on a spot marked for it. Now immediately line up your sights on the target. Hold your breath, aim, take up the trigger slack and squeeze off the shot. Now if your position is right, your rifle will naturally fall back on the target after each shot. And you can fire a whole clip with only slight pauses between to get your sights in perfect alignment. At first, you'll practice by the numbers so that your coach and instructors can check the accuracy of each position and movement. Take it by the numbers once more, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Ready position. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Once you've learned it by the numbers, you'll practice against time so that you can check your progress, see how you're going. We start you slowly and speed you up gradually until you can take your position, aim, and get off your first shot in nine seconds. Here's how it goes in dry shooting. Watch how smoothly the five steps flow together into one continuous motion. Go ahead, Sergeant. Lock. Simulate load. Ready on the right. Ready on the left. Ready on the fire line. Target. Up. Time. Nine seconds doesn't sound like much time, but you've just seen that it's plenty for an experienced man. It won't be long before you'll melt smoothly into your prone position with seconds to spare to squeeze off your first shot. Naturally, the faster you get into a good position, the more time you've got to aim and fire. So, slip into position, and then take your time to get an accurate aim and a careful squeeze on that trigger. A near miss in seven or eight seconds is no good. What you want is a bullseye in nine seconds. Try to get a smooth flow in every movement as you drop to the ground. Think of how it would look if every move were made very slowly. Target, up! One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Now hold your breath and take a careful aim. Six. Seven. Squeeze slowly and steadily on that trigger. Eight. Time. Every one of you can do it as easily as that if you remember this one point. Do it as fast as you can do it right. Never hurry your aim or your trigger squeeze. Now for the sitting position. First, take the correct position and try it out to be sure the rifle points naturally at the target. Then mark the places for your heels and your seat. Stand up in the marks for your heels. At the command, target's up. Drop quickly on the spot marked for your seat, breaking the fall with your right hand. There's another way of getting into the sitting position that you may find easier. After you've marked the places for your feet, cross your legs and rise. Stand with your legs crossed until the command targets up. Then bend your knees and sink to the ground. This is quicker than the other method, but it forces you to take your eyes off the target while you set your feet in the places marked for them. Otherwise, the action is the same. Place your left elbow. Hit the rifle butt into the hollow of your shoulder and complete your firing position. Hold your breath, aim, and squeeze off the shot. With practice, you'll be able to go from the ready to the sitting position and get off your first aimed shot in seven seconds. Sergeant, let's see that against time. Lock. Simulate load. Ready on the right. Ready on the left. Ready on the fire line. 
Target. Up. Time. Here too, of course. The quicker you take the correct position, the more time you've got to squeeze off your shot. The exercise in the kneeling position is like the other two. You mark the places for your feet and your right knee and get up. On command, you lock, load, and stand ready. When you hear targets up, take the kneeling position you've marked, hold your breath, aim, and squeeze the trigger. With practice, you'll be able to go from the ready position to the kneeling position and get off your first shot in seven seconds. Target, up. One, two, three, four, five, six, time. I've said the place to save time in all three of these exercises is in taking your positions. But don't misunderstand me. That does not mean scrambling into the wrong position in a hurry. In rapid fire, just as in any other phase of rifle work, you've got to be in the correct position before you start to aim. After you've learned to take the three firing positions and squeeze off your first shot at the required speed, you're ready for the cadence exercise. The purpose of which is to develop a rhythm, a regular beat at about three second intervals. For one thing, it's easier to work smoothly in a regular cadence. For another, on the range, you're allowed a limited time to take your position, fire your first clip, reload, and get off your second clip. And the three second interval will bring you out comfortably within the time allotted. We don't expect you to be able to do it all at once. We'll start you dry shooting at the rate of an aimed shot every five seconds. Then every four and a half. Then every four, which in dry shooting corresponds to three seconds on the range because the hand operation of the piece is slower than its actual operation in firing. Here again, the coach and pupil method is the best. The pupil simulates firing while the coach works the operating rod handle. To keep the bolt from being held in the open position when it is thrown back, the coach puts a small block of wood in the clip. There are several other ways to get the same result. But in this company, we find this method the easiest and the best. Your squad leaders will have a supply of these blocks and will issue them when they are needed. Let's take the exercise at five second intervals. Hammer down, coach is ready. Boom. Boom. As I said before, in these exercises, the coach is just about as important as the rifle. In the cadence exercises, when he forces back the operating rod handle, he acts as part of the rifle. In doing this, he must not lean against the handle. He strikes the handle sharply and immediately removes his hand so that the bolt can snap back into position. It's a good idea for the coach to wear a glove or wrap a handkerchief around his hand. Strike that operating rod handle a couple of hundred times if you want to know why. Bolt. Notice that the coach strikes the handle only bolt. when the command bolt is given by the instructor. But bolt. notice too that the command is given whether or not the rifleman is squeezed off his shot. Bolt. If the pupil is late, bolt. the coach does not operate the bolt but waits for the next command after the pupil is fired. You'll do this exercise a minute at a time, in the prone, then in the sitting, then in the kneeling position, gradually speeding up the cadence 
until you're proficient. In cadence exercises, be sure to take the correct position so that your sights return oh. automatically to the aiming point after each shot. Keep your eye constantly oh. on the sight picture and squeeze that trigger with a oh. steadily increasing pressure until the hammer falls. Then keep your finger on the trigger oh. for the next shot. Yes, I'll say it again. It's constant drill in speed and accuracy that makes the expert rifleman. But even constant drill won't do you any good unless you make each movement right every time. Oh. After you've learned to fire in cadence, you'll move on to two exercises in simulated rapid fire. For the first of these, you'll use a clip with a wooden block. On the command targets up, you'll go from standing to the prone position and squeeze off your first shot in nine seconds. Then, you'll get off each of the next seven rounds of your first clip at four second intervals. But there won't be anybody to call off these intervals for you. Your cadence exercise will have taught you the rhythm. When you hear eighth round, reload, you'll simulate reloading. And you'll have nine seconds to do it and squeeze off your ninth shot. Once again, four seconds each for the next seven rounds. When you hear last round, you'll still have five seconds extra before the command cease firing. This exercise is done in a total of 79 seconds. All right, let's see how it goes. Lock, simulate load. Ready on the right. Ready on the left. Ready on the fire line. Target. First round. The first shot should be fired in the first nine seconds. You've got four Three. seconds for each of the next seven shots. Four. Huh. Six. Seven. Your eighth shot should be off by the time Eight. you hear this. Eighth round. Reload. But remember, you count your own shots. If you fired the eighth round before you hear reload, you don't have to wait. Huh. Reload immediately. Ten. Seven. Twelve. Thirteen. If you keep your fire rhythmical and steady, you'll get off your last shot just as it's called. Fifteen. Sixteen. Last round. If you don't, you still have five more seconds to finish up without hurrying. Eight. Firing. That's your first exercise in simulated rapid fire. But before we go on, there are several things I want to point out. In all of your rapid fire exercises, be sure to count your shots aloud, as you heard Private Oss do just now. By counting the shots, you know exactly what's left in your clip and you're ready to reload when you should, which saves time. But there's another reason. You've got to use the air in your lungs to call the number, and that forces you to breathe at just the right time. But uh, don't get the idea that counting aloud is just a training exercise. You'll call the numbers out in battle, too, and your reasons for doing it will be the same, but a whole lot stronger. In combat, Knowing when to reload will save more than time. Getting caught with one round in your rifle when the enemy is coming at you is as good a way as any to put an end to your career. When you're firing, keep your eye on the target all the time. Don't look away. If you squeeze your trigger properly, 
The recoil will jerk your head up a little, but it'll fall back with the rifle. And when you have to look away to reload, be sure you get back on the right target. On the range, the prettiest dead center five on the wrong target goes down on your score as a zero. And remember, the habits you're forming now are the ones you'll take with you into battle, where your target is hard to see and is easily lost. In dry runs, the command bolt is not given. The coach listens for the click of the hammer and strikes the operating rod handle back the second he hears it. When you simulate, or pretend, to load that second clip, don't hurry it. If you do, you'll only cheat yourself out of some valuable training. Don't do it as Private Auster's doing it now. That kind of exercise is worse than none because it creates bad habits. Go through your simulated reloading exactly as if you were handling a clip. A fumble in reloading when you're firing for record would knock your score into a cocked hat. That's your first exercise in simulated fire. And you'll practice it in the prone, sitting, and the kneeling position. You're allowed a total of 79 seconds for the prone exercise, but only 74 seconds for the sitting and kneeling. Seven seconds instead of nine to take the position and fire the first round. Eight seconds instead of nine to reload. And three seconds extra instead of five at the end. Except for the position and time, the sitting and kneeling exercises are exactly like the prone. The purpose is to teach you to keep the proper cadence, even though no one is calling bolt. Once you've learned this, you'll repeat the series using dummy rounds and no wooden block. The timing is the same and the performance is the same. But with dummy rounds, you must learn to load a fresh clip quickly. And that's a trick in itself. As you take the clip from your belt, grasp it at the base and near one edge between your thumb and forefinger. Then carry it forward, swinging it up until the bullets point forward. Place the clip in the receiver and slide your thumb forward along the top of it to the center of the cartridge. Double your fingers up out of the way. Raise your arm and press the clip down into the receiver until the clip latch engages. As you raise your thumb, the operating rod handle should snap forward. If it doesn't, strike it with the heel of your hand and your rifle is ready to be fired again. Here's how a trained rifleman reloads in the prone position. In the sitting position. And in the kneeling position. When you first do these exercises, you'll feel that 79 and 74 seconds are going to rush you. But there's plenty of time to get off those 16 shots. So don't try to beat the clock. That won't help your score. When you get on the range, you're scored on your hits. Don't get buck fever. The stopwatch is important, but don't let it push you around. Don't be in such a rush that you spray bullets all over the target. If you're going to shoot wild, you can get all your shots off in 30 seconds. But don't do it. When a recruit does, and then turns and finds an old timer beside him, just loading his second clip, well, he feels like a fool. Take it easy. There's no time to pick daisies, but there's plenty of time to fire 16 shots and get 16 bullseyes. And remember, even 12 bulls are better than 16 threes. So don't get excited. Slow and careful. That's the rule that brings in the high scores on the range. And it's the rule 
that mows them down in battle. Up to now, we've been discussing the pupil and what he does. Now let's look at the coach. In rapid fire exercises, he's got plenty to do and not much time to do it in. In addition to his other duties you already know about, he makes sure the pupil takes his position quickly and without waste movement. That he takes up the trigger slack with one decisive action and squeezes the trigger correct one. Two. Two. Four. That he breathes after each shot. One. Two. That he keeps his finger on the trigger. Two. Two. And that when he reloads from the belt, he doesn't fumble. The moment the hammer falls, the coach throws the operating rod handle back sharply and gets his hand out of the way. In rapid fire, the coach is the key man. He's got to know his stuff and keep his eyes open. If he's on the job, he can help his pupil a lot and himself even more. Any questions on rapid fire? All right, let's sum up. Rapid fire is slow fire speeded up a little. In rapid fire, just as in slow fire, you take the right position, hold your breath and aim properly, and squeeze your trigger smoothly, even if you take a little longer than you should. Speed? Yes. We count the seconds you take, and we work you against the stopwatch. But speed is worse than useless, unless you do everything right every time you do it. Take it slowly at first, and make every movement exactly as you should. Speed will come of itself. And it won't be long before the right way is the natural way for you. The only way. Then, when you find yourself in a tight spot in battle, you won't lose your head and blaze away wild. That's the quick way to the cemetery. And for my money, a good soldier is a live soldier. Dependable habits will make you calm and cool and confident, and you'll hit what you're shooting at. That's pretty important, when what you're shooting at is shooting at you. Thank you.